Welcome everyone. This is our Friday Live where we talk about information, tips, tricks, and all that good stuff on our tools and supplies that we make and sell here at Music Medic. Today we're going to be talking about uh, the stuff you need to get a stuck rod out of a key, including a bonus tip on how to use alum. So let's get into it. Ryan, we're going to... Oh, I got all my gear on. You are I'm geared up, man. I'm ready for the alum. Let's talk about, uh, just give them a quick overview of some of the tools that they might need to get a stock rod out. So they're going to need several things, uh, but the first thing maybe is going to be a screwdriver. Yep, uh, absolutely. Uh, obviously, if you're trying to unstick a, a stuck rod, or you have to try screwdriver first. So um, just kind of come some techniques on, on using a screwdriver to get some unstuck rods. A uh, very important one is um, anytime you are dealing with a screwdriver with a stuck rod, you want to keep your hand on this side of the blade. You never want to keep it in front of it. Um, you're going to be exerting a lot of force, a lot of torque to try to get this rod unstuck, and you don't want to slip and accidentally shish kebab your fingers. Uh -uh. Um, so anytime you are dealing with stuck rods, and really anytime, if, even if it's not stuck, you just want to get in the habit of having your hand on this side of the screwdriver. All right. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. That, so that, that would be my first tip is, is obviously having a, a strong tip screwdriver, uh, something that you can get a lot of torque with. Um, if you need a little extra, you can actually use a pair of pliers and maybe get another little torquing as well. So that's, so Ryan, we've got our first two sets of tools are going to be a, the proper size screwdriver to give you leverage. Music Medic carries a whole variety of sizes depending on what instrument you're using and the rod or pivot screw slot size and then a sturdy pair of pliers. Now, particularly with the pliers, they got to have a couple of different aspects. They've got to have smooth jaws. And in our opinion, the parallel jaw is probably the best. That is for, for my, my go-to pair of pliers is the Nitex duck build. Um, it is a smooth jaw plier. It is very strong and it also has that parallel action. So it's a triple threat. Okay. Um, I like to use this when I am, let's say the rod is, is starting to come out. Um, what you can do is you can use your parallel Nitex pliers. You can actually grab it and then actually twist and turn. Um, traditionally, when you're reusing a pair of pliers to remove a rod, you want to be very cautious of the slot that is in the rod. You don't want to use your pliers in a manner that actually will squish that slot closed. Um, here, this rod is, is probably frozen, corroded, stuck in there. Um, chances are we're going to be replacing it anyway. So at this point in time, I can just use my pliers and really get a lot of force, a lot of torque, a lot of gripping power. Um, it's really one of the very few times that if you don't have a, a, a smooth jaw Nitex, you can use a serrated jaw uh, pair of pliers. And that way you can get a lot of good, uh, solid clamping force to really pull that rod out. Okay, so we've got those pliers. That's our shop dog in the background. Uh, what about the what about the pin vise trick? The pin vise I really like to use. Let's say it's sticking out just a little bit. You can use a pin vise to actually clamp around that rod. Um, I like using a pin vise because it has that clamping force that goes all the way around versus this parallel action or even that scissoring action. Um, so you can use a pin vise. You can tighten that up, use your, your Nitex to tighten that up, and then actually use this to work the whole rod out. Awesome. So we've talked about screwdrivers, we've talked about pin vices, we've talked about pliers. Let's talk about oil. I mean, that may be kind of the first step. Uh, so we're kind of backing up into it, yeah. but what type of oil are we going to use to break free a rusted rod? I like to use a penetrating oil, and when you get it, you can get it in a pretty much anywhere hardware store. It comes in a big container like this, as you can see. And you can see this is not easy to apply oil exactly where you need it on the saxophone because we just need it in this one spot. We don't need it all over. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very difficult to use this to apply your penetrating oil where you need it. So what I like to do is I like to use um, little oilers, little bottles. Um, and I do believe we have a set uh, of needle oilers like so. Uh, they even come with a funnel, I believe, which makes it very easy to fill these little containers. But this is what I like to use to apply my penetrating oil. Um, first off, determining where it is stuck. So let's say for sake of argument that the, the threads of this rod are frozen within this post head. So we know where it's stuck. So what I would do is I would take my needle oiler, I would apply a little bit of oil to the front side, the post face, 
And I will also apply it to that back side where you see the end of the threads kind of sticking out. Um, and then I would take a heat source. My preferred go-to method is to use an open flame. One of our blades are hand torches. And then what you're going to do is you're just fanning it. You're just fanning. You're not actually heating it up to where it's red hot. You're just going to fan the flame like so. Uh, and what that will do is that will thin the penetrating oil out, allowing it to actually get in. Um, it does two things. It, it dissolves a lot of the gunk and grease and grime. And then obviously having that oil in there will hopefully allow it to lubricate. So then you can actually break it open um, using your screwdriver. Now, if that doesn't work, Ryan, we're going to go on to the cut stage. And what is the primary tool that we're going to use to cut a rod out? Now, we talked about this on Wednesday and went into all the techniques, but what are the details of the type of cutting tool they're going to use to cut the rod out? Right. Let's say you've exhausted all your resources. You've tried your screwdrivers. You've tried your pliers. You've tried your pin vices. You've tried your penetrating oil. You've applied penetrating oil hour after hour for the past week and a half. You need to move on to the next stage, which is the cut stage. Um, for that, I would use a jeweler saw. And a jeweler saw is something like this, but it uses a variety of different saw blades that come in different thicknesses. Um, I would use, I believe it's the number two. Rich. Number number two is 12 thousandths Yes, the number two thickness. 12 thousandths thickness. So it is very, very thick. Um, three thousandths is the thickness of a human hair. This is 12. So this is four times the thickness of a human hair, if I do my math correctly. Um, and what you're going to do, and again, we've determined that the threads are stuck in here. Everything mm -hmm. else fine. The, the, the keys move fine on the rod. So what we're going to do is actually cut this space in between the post face and the end of the hinge tube is where I'm aiming for. I'm going to try to not do too much damage to my post face. So I'm going to get in there and actually cut the threads free from the rod. So what you can then do is once you cut that, you can then hopefully pull that rod out, remove the keys, and now you have a post that is still soldered on with the threads that are stuck in. So how do we, how do we get that out? That's right. That brings us to our bonus tip. The bonus tip is going to be how to use alum. So we've gone through all of the different methods of how to get the rod out, and we've, we've, it's totally, totally stuck. So we've had to cut it, and we've got, say, a post or a key uh, with a piece of ferrous metal. Ferrous is some sort of steel. Is it ferrous or ferrous? Ferrous. 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 We've got this steel or iron, and we've got a non-ferrous or ferrous metal. Uh, and alum is a material that is going to eat away at ferrous metal, but it doesn't eat at non-ferrous metal, so it's not going to break down aluminum or brass like what most likely your key is going to be. So Ryan is going to show us... Uh, well, Ryan, we've got two different pots here. We want to talk about the two different pots that we have yep. here. Talk a little bit about alum. Alum, in order for it to work, needs to be dissolved in water, and it, that water needs to be heated to kind of a rolling boil, a very low, kind of a high simmer, low boil. Um, and that's why we have the aluminum pot. We have that on a hot plate, and we also have a crock pot over here as well. And there are pros and cons to using both systems um, here. But the, the, the first thing is you need to heat the water up and you need to, to add your alum. So let's go ahead let me put the face shield down. You guys are going to get a nice overhead view. We're going to add it to this aluminum pot here. So I'm going to open that up. There we are. Nice. And I'm going to add this, I believe, is two pounds of alum. Okay. So we're adding two pounds to about, you know, I gosh, it's probably five, five, four, four or five quarts four of five quarts water. Of water. Um, I'd like to say the exact measurement, but the biggest thing is you need to add alum until it stops dissolving. Um, so it almost needs to be like a very thick slurry. So let's go ahead and add some alum in here. Dump that right. in. Looks good. Not the bag. So now we're we're going to stir this up with some sort of non-ferrous. Yeah, some non yeah. plastic or plastic or um, obviously you can see here I just have a brass piece rod. of brass rod and I'm just in here stirring that up. Can they use a wooden spoon? Um. I think you can use a wooden spoon. I wouldn't use it on food afterwards. <laughs> yeah, you can, sure, you can use a, a, a wooden spoon for that. And just so you guys know, sorry to interrupt, but this is a non-food grade alum. This isn't the stuff that you can get at the store, which is sold in small quantities. We sell alum in big bags with free shipping yes. uh, in the United States okay. so right that here. you can make sure that the general rule of thumb, as Ryan said, is to have kind of a thick slurry. Yes. So... All right, so Ryan, we've got that stirred up. We've got it cooking along. 
What's the next step? The next step is once you get all that alum to where it needs to be, you know, uh, dissolved enough and you've added it so where it's kind of a thick slurry, you can then go ahead and, and add your part. Um, so here I have a key, and this is a very common area to have frozen, is the roller rods, okay, on a lot of instruments, especially vintage saxophones. The key itself is uh, brass, but the rod in there is a, um, you know, obviously steel so mm -hmm. the steel rod will dissolve, but nothing will happen aside, some, aside from some slight uh, discoloration of, 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 the, of the metal. Nothing will really happen to the brass. The rod at this point in time is probably toast. So you're just going to have to make a new rod or, or, or find a new rod. Uh, but you would just dip that in. And at this point in time, it's a waiting process. Um, so we can kind of talk about the pros and cons of youth using either system. Uh, before we, we were about to do this video, Kurt came in and, and, and you know, was given some, some advice as far as using alum. And he said that in, in his research, he found that you have to use an aluminum pot in order to really, I guess, properly use alum to its fullest extent. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's good. And I, I get that, but it's a time thing. Um, you have an aluminum pot sitting on a hot plate. Uh, and it's one of those things that using alum, it takes days in order for it to completely dissolve away uh, that steel rod. And, and I'm talking at least three days of constant boiling, keeping it up. You have to come back to it. You have to top it off with more water. You have to keep stirring. So it's a very long process. I myself would never leave a hot plate unattended. I would turn my crock pot to low and let that set up overnight, just keep that heat going and keep it going. And um, So you have some pros and cons to using uh, the crock pot, it doesn't get as hot. It maybe doesn't, uh, you know, super boost that, that alum to its fullest extent um, versus the aluminum pot. Uh, obviously, this is much bigger. Uh, so if you have a, a key that you really need to fully submerge, um, on the other hand, you have to add quite a bit of alum to something this size and you're using a hot plate. Um, also, the downside of using an aluminum pot is... As you can see here, this was an old pot that we used to use in the pro shop for alum. And you can see that dark spot right there is actually a hole. Um, and if I had a screwdriver, I can actually, I can demonstrate this. So here you go. So if you didn't believe me, it's a hole. So what happened was, even though this is non-farious, an alum shouldn't eat away at it over time of using it. This was used for years and years and years and, and, and just sat in there and we would apply more water to it and keep reusing the same alum over and over and over again. But you can see it even ate away at that. Now that also could be because we were using it on a hot plate. Um, so there's something to take into consideration. You have the pros and cons, but this is a very time consuming process. It is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, you'll have to keep coming back and checking it. Um, and it is not a very quick process. I guess with the one advantage of it, Ryan, though, is it's super cheap. Absolutely. I mean, you can yep. use one of these pots over and over and over there. You can get them anywhere. Yep. Uh, same thing with the crock pot. Absolutely. You know, the crock pot can stay warming overnight. The key aspect is you have to make sure that your mixture is correct. So it has to be kind of a slicker, thicker slurry, yes. thicker slurry. And you have to also keep checking the water level so it doesn't evaporate correct yeah the nice thing is you're not doing any mechanical damage to the post you're not trying to drill that rod out so you can you know once that that you know threaded portion kind of erodes away you can reuse that brass post again you just need to do a little bit of cleaning up um you know for any kind of discoloration that may have happened cool well ryan thank you so much for that demonstration I appreciate your using the safety gear. I also have safety gear on too. These are safety glasses, just so everybody knows. And uh, that's going to conclude our Friday video. Stay tuned uh, for next Wednesday when we go over how to align saxophone posts. And that will also apply to flute. On April 29th, we're going to have a high-tech uh, key fitting course with Ryan, who's going to do a full day of advanced key fitting. So look at musicmedic.com for that key fitting course. And um, that's going to do it for now. So until next time, happy repairing.